Hi everyone, Greg here. I'm very pleased to say that I just recently passed 256 subscribers and for a programming channel that is a real milestone. And of course as programmers we are not concerned with those base 10 numbers, they don't really mean all that much to us. The binary numbers and the hexadecimal numbers, those are the ones that really matter. So 256 subscribers, this is 100 in hexadecimal, that is really a significant milestone. And I would like to say a big thank you to everybody who subscribed. Now I thought to celebrate 256 subscribers, I'll do a video that's a little bit special, a video that's lighter, that's a little bit tongue in cheek. And so I decided, what about creating a new programming language? What about writing an interpreter and I went back and forth in my mind whether I would simply create a C interpreter or whether I would make it genuinely a new language and so I believe I'll go with the new language but it will be heavily inspired by C because you all know that I really love C and because it's going to be a programming language that I don't want you to use for real work I'm gonna call it dumb C, right? So D U C and if Tux can have an X in his name, then so can I. So Dux. Dux is gonna be the name of this new programming language. And every good programming language needs a good villain, a good logo. I mean, I created a logo, so there you're looking at it now. Uh this is the logo for Dux. So isn't he cute? So I think that he looks like the little cousin of Tux maybe five times removed i mean they have the same colors and i mean they're quasi identical right? they're, they're pretty much the same creature okay so i'm gonna write this interpreter well it is gonna be a small bit of a silly language i do want it to really work however so i strongly believe in the incremental approach so the incremental approach is basically where you start off with something very simple and then you add one feature, and then you add another feature, you add another feature, and you work your way up towards a more solid application. As opposed to a more monolithic approach where you decide ahead of time all the features you want, and then try to do everything all at once. So the advantage of the incremental approach is at each step, at each major step, you actually have a working application. And if you go the wrong way, if you make a major mistake, you always have a working application to fall back on. You just go back one step and you still have a working application. Also, it allows you to fail early, to notice problems early on, especially when it comes to the user experience. So if you have, let's say an MVP, a minimum viable product, and you start using it and then you realize, oh well, this idea, this idea looked good in my head and I thought it was going to be very intuitive and I thought it was going to be very, what would you say, very enjoyable to use. But now that I actually have it, I realize, well, that's not really how it feels like. Maybe it needs a different approach. You can notice this early. So the incremental approach, I think, is the better approach to write software. It's not without its disadvantages. So one disadvantage would be that you could make certain design decisions early on that seemed like a good idea at the time. And as you add more features, as the focus shifts, you might then start to regret certain design decisions. You might decide to undo some of the decisions you've made earlier because now with more features, different decisions make sense. So there's a risk of having to redo some of the work later on. Nonetheless, I think that the incremental approach is going to win quasi every time and it's a much more flexible and a vastly superior approach to doing things and this is what I'm going to do here. So when it comes to an interpreter, you can make your life easier or hard by making certain choices when it comes to the language. So for example... Uh, writing an actual C interpreter would be very difficult, not only because it's a big language and there's a lot to it, but if you take, for example, the word static, well, the word, the keyword static can mean different things in different contexts. So when your parser does encounter the word, 
it still doesn't really know what to do with it because it still has to figure out from context which static you mean. If this had been different words, so for example, you could have a static variable, which is a variable that will persist after calling the function multiple times, as opposed to having a function with a with the word static in front of the prototype, which means you're only supposed to call it from within the translation unit. So if your parser encounters the word static, it then still needs to figure out from context what you really meant. So if the different roles of the keyword had been split up into actual different keywords, it would have been much easier to write the parser. So I'm going to try to make certain design decisions here to make my life easier. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide right now that any variable, any variable name must always begin with a dollar sign which is a feature that you see in PHP and I think Perl as well. So that means anytime you see a dollar sign, you know that's the begin of a variable name. Unless, obviously, there's a syntax error or unless you see the dollar sign within double quotes, so if it's part of a string, or unless it is within a comment. So you see, even with that rule, there are some caveats, but nonetheless, in principle, at least, when you see a dollar sign, it's the start of a variable. Also, I'm going to assume that everything will be written in ASCII. I am not going to consider, and certainly not in the beginning, I am not going to consider Unicode. Okay, so those are some decisions that should make my life easier when writing this, uh, this interpreter. So what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to start with writing a hello world program in this language because I want to go as soon as possible towards a point where the language is actually functional to use so I'm just going to decide now what the hello world program is and then I'm going to make sure that the interpreter as soon as possible can actually deal with that case and so I will have at least a very simplistic interpreter done very soon so sublime and I'm going to call it hello.duc and so every program written in this language will have the .duc as a uh, as a file extension. So here we are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do put s hello world. And this is all I'm going to do at the moment. Because again, I want to get as soon as possible to a point where the parser can actually deal with that. So for now, I'm ignoring functions i'm ignoring header files and you know everything that everything else basically i just want the interpreter to be able to print hello world on the screen as soon as possible so basically the way i expect this to work is if i type in this that the interpreter would actually load the file and it would run the program and you would see hello world so what I have here is the very first version of this interpreter. And this only really just contains boilerplate at this point. So if we go down here, this is the main. So it's looking whether a file has actually been uh, passed on as an argument. If not, it just prints an error message. This, by the way, duck print error. This is implemented very simply as a macro, uh, and it's going to say docs error and then the actual message. Right, so it's it's printing out the message here. So this is just a bit of style when printing out the error. And that's all it is really. So have you give have you passed on a file name? If so, does the file exist? Right. So. When you see TEC as a prefix, that means it comes from my personal library, technical. So just a function checking does the file exist. Otherwise, okay, another error message. And then it just opens the file and loads the contents of the file. If that works, it just says file loaded. If it doesn't work, then it says failed to load. So this is like the starting point, okay? From here, 
we can uh, we can start the actual interpreter proper but let's just test if this actually works now so i'm gonna do gcc hold on um dash o docs main dot c p threads so what i have I've, I've included this library, which is something I've actually made on the channel in previous videos. And this uses uh, p threads, which I'm not actually making use of in this program, but uh, I just need that flag so that it will compile. So there we go, should compile in a second. And now if I run the program, and I'm not passing on a file name, then sure enough. If I do pass on the file name, then it says uh, that it loaded the file correctly. So everything so far is working just fine. So there is something else I want to add here. I want ducks to be an actual command so that I could write this. And I want to be able to write this no matter which diary uh, that, sorry, I want to be able to write this no matter which directory I'm in. So I would have to make sure I get the path of the file name right. But I just want to be able to type in the name of the program no matter which uh, directory I'm in. And in order to do that, I have to make sure that this is something that Bash does recognize as a command. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the path name of this program and I'm going to copy it into the bin directory in in my home directory so the, the yeah the bin directory inside my home directory and now I can just do it like this okay there is one extra step I could add here. Um, if I go back to one thing I could do is I could add this. Now what this does is it basically tells the kernel if I try to run this file as a program it will say if you want to run this program, you have to use this interpreter to do it. So let's see if that works. And before I do that, I have to actually give execution permission on the file. And so now if I do it, then it did run the program because it is saying file hello.duck loaded. So Okay, so now the next step is to actually write the interpreter proper. All right, so now the interpreter is written. So let me just compile it. And if I actually run the program, then this time we have our hello world. It is working. So let us look at the code. And the code, bear in mind, is really bare bones. And the intent here was just to make sure that this Hello World program would actually run. And I am by no means saying that this is how you should actually write an interpreter. But anyway, let's have a look at it. So the first thing it does is it skips the shebang line. So if we get the code itself, this line here is known as the shebang line and again it is something it's basically a message to the kernel and it's not part of the program proper so it, it doesn't do anything for our purpose here and we can just skip it so we skip the shebang line now this line is or, the, or this function is actually not difficult so uh, i think it's down here somewhere yeah, so basically we look at the beginning of the buffer and this shebang line needs to be the very first thing that appears in the file. So if we notice that the hash 
and the exclamation point is present what we do is we skip over those two characters and then we continue to move forward in the buffer until such a time that we find the new line and then we get one more past the new line and this is actually when the program really starts so uh, yeah that I think that part is actually quite simple so here we are so I created a data struct a data structure token so basically an interpreter will have a tokenizer so a tokenizer is basically it goes through the text and makes kind of a first quick assessment as to what it is looking at okay is the next thing coming up a string is it a number is it something that looks like the name of a function is it something that looks like the name of a variable okay since we have made this choice that variable name start with a dollar sign uh, the, the tokenizer will know straight away whether it's a variable name or not so uh, basically that's what a tokenizer does it goes is, is the first pass through the text where it makes the first initial assessment as to what it's looking at okay so this function here get next token it is obviously a very important function but here first we initialize that data structure and we just go through the text um, so we've loaded the text into buffer so we just go through it until we get to the end of file okay? we get the next token so that is the first token after the shebang line that we've just skipped here by the way this function returns buffer so that is basically the position of the buffer immediately after this shebang line and then you see token start next equals buffer so if we have a quick look at the data structure token type okay type is basically we have an enum here these are for the time being uh the the types of tokens that i consider so th this is just kind of um what what i'm going to fall back on when i don't have a particular type uh for it or when there is an actual syntax error so we have function name, data type, variable name, uh, what else have we got, string, keyword, and, and the file. I'm not actually using all of these yet, but as, as I further develop the parser, it's going to be used at some point. So the type of token, where in the, in the, where in the buffer that token begins and how long it is and, and that's all it does and then start next this is basically giving a hint to the, the next time that duck get next token gets called where from it needs to start looking for the next token okay right. so get the next token and then okay i know it looks a bit strange to have a switch with only one case but obviously the expectation is that there will be more cases here in the future and function name is all i need right now to make this hello world program work so doug execute function so if we look at execute function basically what it does it checks if that token is put s and if so then i will call that function doc execute put s it seemed here as well a bit silly to have this function just to support one single function so i created p error which is also something that you have in the standard uh, c runtime library and it's mostly the same as put s except that this outputs a string to the error stream as opposed to the standard output this goes to standard error that's the only difference 
So if if that's our token, we call this function instead. Otherwise, some error message, unknown function. So then if we look at doc exec put s, it will get the next token. Now the next token here is Right, so this is going to be the tokenizer, which I'm going to show you the code for this in a second. It will identify put s as a function name. It will do that in part based on the fact that there is a bracket here because all functions need to have a need to be followed by a bracket. And so the you saw start next in the in the data type token that will be set here at the beginning of this string so when we call next token again it is basically gonna when we call duck next token again it will basically pass on this string as the next token so that's what it does here and then here we see if something other than a string is in the function then we have an error now of course, we could have something other than a string there. We could have a function in there, a function with input s, if that function does return a string. So this tokenizer, again, is very primitive. We're going to consider those other cases later. What we're doing here is at the end of the token, we're putting a new line. Because that's actually the behavior of put s. It outputs the string and then it actually adds a new line at the end of it. All right. So we're duplicating that behavior here. And then write. Write is a syscall. So when you do a print f or a put s, anytime you touch the hardware, it must go through the kernel. The kernel is the only the only software on your computer that can actually touch the hardware directly and that can ultimately determine what appears on the screen. So if you do a print f or a put s, those are basically wrappers around the syscall write. It's maybe not entirely fair to call them wrappers because they'll actually do some work for you, but ultimately they call write. So what I decided to do here is to just call write directly. So write the file descriptor one, which is standard output. The the token. Now token plus one because we just skipped that double quote. And then the length minus one. Okay. And minus one because what this new line here will do, it will actually override the closing double quotes of the string that we don't need to display, right? So we we only want to display the hello world and the exclamation point, and we don't actually want to display those quotes here so we just either skip them or overwrite them um yeah so obviously you have a lot of rough edges to what we have for now so i said for now we'll simply put as end as it should so what does follow here is a closing bracket and a semicolon and for now the parser just kind of assumes that that's there and and doesn't check it So that's that's what that does here. So start next is basically it's it skips over all that and and puts the start next on the line below so that so that it's ready basically to process the next line if there is one. P error is basically the same thing except that it outputs to standard error. So um, I hope that makes sense now. So we have uh, as long as we don't have the end of file token, we get the next token. We see what is it? Is the function find that we continue to process that and execute the function, and we go around and around like this. So the only thing I need to show you now is next token. All right, so where is that? Here it is. So 
we start to check from start next inside that token data structure we skip whatever is white space so this will skip over spaces tabs new lines that kind of stuff and then okay if the buffer at that point is null then we've reached in the file so that's that if we have a double quote then we tokenizer finds a string and then we just find the next uh, double quote to find the end of the string and in the token struct we we set everything including the type now here is something what if the string itself contains double quotes what if i want something like this well this is not going to work obviously this is going to cause an error now in c the way you fix that is you do this right this backslash basically means take whatever follows literally this is literally a double quote within the string and not a double quote indicating the end of the string so for now our tokenizer is not able to cope with that situation and we just leave that as it is for now and in later versions of docs we're gonna fix that so buffer equals the dollar sign so it finds a variable uh, we're not we're not really uh, using that at the moment and then basically we're focused on the function name here so that is going to be put s so if it finds something that is somewhere between a and z in lowercase or uppercase because that's what the function name needs to begin with but then once it is actually going through the function name uh, we can have the numerals and we can have the underscore so it's just that the function name is not allowed to start with those ones but it can be in the name itself so then we skip over more white space if it's present we check if there is a an open bracket that makes it a function name otherwise it would be a keyword right so it would skip over the white space if i did that we're not using keywords at the moment i just realized that if we have something like while there would actually also be a bracket there so this is yeah that's not actually good but it works for now but uh yeah there will this will have to be done differently but uh, i leave it like this for now so that is version 0 0.00001 of docs okay and so it can do the hello world program and of course it can do other things like um basically whatever i put in there or almost and then just for the heck of it let's demonstrate that that p error also works so something went wrong and now let me just run this and then sure enough now it's outputting those three things and this is being output to stdr i know as a matter of fact that that's the case because i can actually separate the streams so here what that means it means take standard output and def null is like a black hole inside the linux kernel whatever goes into that is never seen again so it basically is used to make data disappear so standard output redirected with that chevron redirected to def null and if i run that then i'm only seeing stdr as a standard error and then of course i can do it the other way around and then i'm not actually seeing standard error when i do it that way so this is everything ducks can do so far
All right, so next version of Ducks, and I thought the most obvious thing to tackle next is to allow for the escaping of those double quotes. So will Ducks uh, display this properly? Well, what I've done here is I've added those two things. Uh, when, when the type is string, a copy of the string will be made. So this will be a character string. And then the length of the string is stored here. So we have a macro here, max string, right? So Dux is not going to support any string larger than this. Uh, inc stands for including. So including the new character, it's just one bigger than that. Okay. So let's go to the, the main function here, going down quite a bit main and so here that's the same code but i did add we initialize that string so we just do a malloc and then we set the string to zero now that i think about it mm, i don't really need that i, I could do this Yeah, that's probably good enough. Okay. Duck's next token. Duck next token. Get next token. It's where we're going to have the most changes. So, where is it? So, here. So, this is the part where we finding the uh the string i've added this bit here so now this is the while okay so once you find a double quote this is the while that looks for the following double quote where the string ends but what it does here when it does find a double quote it checks first whether the previous character is this backslash and if it is, then it moves the buffer forward, so it skips over that double quote, and then it just looks for the next one. Okay, so this extra variable is added here, previous, to keep track of whatever the previous uh, character is. Some sanity checks, so that one was already there. We just see if the length is not bigger than it's supposed to be. We copy the string, the talk string. Um, here, unescape the double quotes. So basically, this will, so if, if in the string somewhere we see this, then it will move, it will change it to just the double quotes, right? So that's what the unescape does. Uh, will I show? I might as well show you this function. It's a very simple function. So while it goes through the, uh, it goes through the string until the end of the string, and then if it sees this this backslash character, and if it sees that it's followed by the double quote then it does i call it a string shift it basically um how would i say that it basically takes everything that follows in the string and moves it back one position all right so it, it would override this character here all right so that's what it does it's it's very simple really Okay, and that's uh, right. And then takes the length of the string. After after we've unescaped it, we take the length of it. That's the string length, which now could be different from this length, right? Because that's the length of the token as it appears in the file. And that is the length of the string after we've changed it. 
Okay. Yeah, actually the length will be different anyway. Because the token contains the double quotes at the start and end of the string. And, and this doesn't. Right. Anyways. So put s i had to change put s as well the 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 minor changes but now we check if the size is right we're, we're still adding this new line at the end right yeah that's pretty much the same thing and now now let's see if that works and it does okay so that's that's double quotes escaping of double quotes taken care of so now this language is a little bit better right what would be the next thing next thing i think we can deal with variables allowing for variables okay Okay, so now I'm going to discuss the last version of Docs for this video. So what I've introduced now are integers. Uh, and Well, basically variables. And integers is the only type that it's currently going to be able to deal with. I decided I didn't like put s. So I just decided I put print string there. Now, this is a bit more wordy, but... What I think I will do eventually is I'm going to have a function print and that will accept just about anything. And if you want to be more specific, then you can use things like print string and print int. And this is what this function print will do anyway. It will then analyze what you're trying to print and based on that, just call print string or print int, probably. I haven't committed to that yet, but that's probably what will end up happening. Anyways, for now, print string and print in, so it will print a number. And as the text says, you can pass on either a number or a variable. So here we have um, str, the variable. And then here we have an actual number. And in each case, print in can deal with that. So this is as much as we're going to develop docs for this first video, right? Now, when we look here at what I had to do uh, in order to make this happen, um, here I had the talk number, so talk token, so a different token type number. I have that. Here, a new struct variable to store the variables. The value of the variable can be either an integer or a float. And here I have a global variable. Now, the thing is, I don't like global variables and I avoid them as much as possible. I am being a little bit lazy here and put the global variable there for convenience. The thing is the way that this this V list is basically a variable list, so it keeps track of all the variables, even though there's only one here. But you will be allowed to use up to 127 variables per function, which I believe is in line with the C standard. I'm not sure if it's C99 or whatever, but I think it's roughly the same as what you could do in C anyway. But eventually once we implement functions, there will be the idea of scope. So that is to say a variable within one function won't be accessible from within another function. So every function will need to have its own V list. And when we get to that we'll we'll, we'll just do this properly so this is like the idea of scope is something that we'll eventually have to rethink completely anyway so this is good enough for this kind of early 
early version of ducks. So for now, a global variable, even though I would not normally condone using global variables. Okay, what what do we have here that it's new? We have create variable, we have get variable. I just realized I've not been very consistent in my naming here. Well, we'll we'll think about that for the next version. Um so if we go down here yeah, So here is the main so th that's basically this the important loop that the parser is going through. Here we have now something else in the switch, duck talk data type. So basically this is when we declare a variable here on the when we create a new variable the first thing on the line is going to be a data type so that's what this is and then in this case we do duck create variable so put s this used to be called put s now is print string mostly the same print int okay so once we arrive here we check the next token so that would be once we have this as a token all right we basically look for whatever is inside the brackets so that token should be of type number or it should be of type variable name anything else will lead to an error and we'll finish the program and then if it is a number we simply that means that number is already in the buffer in the text itself it's part of the token so we just print that out if it's a variable name then we need to find the variable of that name to figure out what the value is and then we print the value of that variable right and before we actually print it we'll have to convert that int back into a string so we can actually print it out right so that's that's print int. I, I don't think there's anything too complicated here. That's print error. That's pretty much the same thing. Execute function. You've seen that already as well. I've just changed the names and I've added an extra function. Okay. Okay. Duck next. Uh, get next token. Here we have an extra section. So this allows us to find the numbers. Then, so again, what we do is once we get start next, we skip over the white space. We see is it the end of the buffer, and then we look what comes next. Is it a double quote? Then we have a string. Is it a dollar sign? Then we have a variable, or is it anything from zero to nine? Then we have a number. Right? That's it basically. So I think that's basically uh yeah I, f I think that's most of get next token uh explained here check the data type we only have you seen that before i don't think you've seen that before so int is the only one we support at the moment if we see car or if we see float and it says currently not supported. This is very incomplete, but again, good enough for now. I think I might just show you this. So, so we are in duck get next token. This is to find a number, and then here is when we encounter text, and that text. Is a function name or as a keyword and of course the data types would be a keyword so here is where we check whether um, whether that's a data type or not okay so here create variable so wh what happens in this instance so we have parsed the text this far we got a data type we say, aha, in this case, we're going to be dealing with a 
with the declaration of a new data type. What we do then is we skip over the white space and then we get another token. That next token at that point is going to be that variable name. Okay, I just realized this might not be quite right. What I may want to do here is if doc talk type not equal if that's not a variable name then basically there will be an error so what would it say um, invalid declaration declaration of variable and then the hash so basically this v list you saw earlier this global variable it will be implemented or it is implemented like a hash table and what that means is Tuckstart basically points to that part of the buffer where we have our token so that's going to be that's going to be our dollar sign str i just realized that really should be one because the first symbol is always a dollar sign anyway what it does is it performs a hash so in this case it's a very simple operation but it performs some operation on the name of the variable in order to figure out where in the array it's supposed to find that variable so if you can imagine the user programmer here can come up with any name he wants for that variable how do you find that variable quickly within the array of variables that you have well you could just go through the array uh, through all the elements of the array one by one until you find it this is going to be slow so instead what we do is we perform an operation on that text on that name to come up with a number that is between 0 and 126 and that then will be the index within the array now there is a possibility when we do that that two variable names will end up in the same place in the array when that happens we just put one after the other and the code as of now is not able to deal with that yet but that's okay because this is only version 0 0.0002 uh, I think probably in the next video we'll actually clean that up to make this work in a way that's a lot more solid but for now this is good enough actually I forgot I had implemented this bit here what it does basically here in this array uses hash as the index it basically looks if there is something already there right if dot type is filled in with something that means there's a variable already there and if so it will increment the hash so as to make sure that it doesn't put two different variables in the same place in the array right the 127 again i'll fix that in a later episode that should not be hard coded And we, we have a degenerate case here where if the user were to actually create 128 variables within the code, then this might actually loop forever because it's looking for the next empty spot. And it's, yeah, this thing here might look for, uh, might loop forever because it looks for the next empty spot and it never finds it. We'll, we'll fix that in a future episode. It, it doesn't, it doesn't matter right now. Okay, so then the next bit, it will actually fill in that V list at that location. So fill in the type, fill in the name of the variable, and then it will look for an equal sign. And if it finds it, it will get next token. It will expect to see a number. I actually don't even check for this here either, okay? Um, yeah, I suppose I can do that.
So for now we only support integers anyway, so it should be a number, whatever follows the equal sign. And then the value of that variable is filled in. And then we set up start next. And so since we put a variable in VList, there must be a way of getting it out later. So I decided I actually want to use one here instead of zero. So it will return that element within the VList. Right. And where do we use get variable? I've already shown you that, that is in the print int. So here, when you have print int, it's a variable name. You, the token at that point will contain the variable name. You get that variable and then you get the value. I hope that makes sense. This is actually working. So we compile it. And then, sure enough, we see that it runs. So that's all I'm going to do this video to improve Ducks. I hope you enjoyed that. If I ever get to 512 subscribers, then I will add more feathers to Ducks. More features. More features to Ducks. Yeah, so if I get to 512 subscribers, I will add more feathers to Ducks. So if you want to see that, subscribe if you haven't already. I want to say a big thank you again to all those who have subscribed. Uh, comment below, give me a like, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.